How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. And it is Thursday here on the show. WrestleMania weekend has begun. And in fact, right now, don't really want to send anybody away from the show. But at this exact moment, the stardom show is kicking off. And commentary is being done by Veda Scott and our own Filthy Tom Lawler. Living his dream of being an announcer for stardom. That is taking place right now. And you can watch it whenever you want, as well as uh, pretty much all of these shows this weekend. You'll be able to watch whenever you can. And, uh, yeah, we're going to go over some of the lineups here today on the show. There's a lot going on. Obviously, because it is Thursday, you know what that means. Yesterday was AEW Dynamite. And, uh, man, what a show that was. What a show that was. We had uh, In the Ring in a Vacuum, two great matches featuring Will Ospreay and Brian Danielson. We had probably the worst segment in the history of AEW. If you think there was one worse, I'd love to hear about it. Billy Gunn absolutely destroying Jay White and winning via disqualification. I mean, my God, I don't even know where to start. So we had that. And, of course, the go-home angle. Well, it wasn't the go-home angle, but the contract signing for Swerve and Samoa Joe, which I thought was very well done. The final angles on both AEW and NXT, very well done this week. Uh, Swerve and Samoa Joe and also the... uh, Mello and Trick Williams segment on NXT. But we got uh, Supercard of Honor coming up tomorrow. NXT Stand Deliver on Saturday. We got news on the Vince McMahon, Janelle Grant WWE lawsuit. Uh, There was an interview with her lawyer yesterday with Thurston and Pollock. And we've got some more on, uh, on pretty much all the big stories over the last couple of days. Cody Rhodes talking about a bunch of stuff on the MMA Hour. Becky Lynch on the New York Times bestseller list. A very busy day. And we shall kick it up after the break. Observer Live.
Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Filthy Tom is currently doing uh, commentary for the Stardom Show. And he's got a lot of stuff he's doing this weekend. And normally he's here Fridays when he can be, Mike. Correct? Yes, he is. Yes. Well, I'm telling you all now, I may be here tomorrow, but I'm not sure. I have to take the family to the airport, and it's WrestleMania weekend. If I make it back in time, I will do the show tomorrow. Are we putting odds on that? I I wouldn't, <laughs> but uh, if you want to, you can. I can just drop them off early, let them go to the lounge, get out of there. But anyway, I want to start with, obviously, the important stuff here, and uh, that is the interview yesterday with Thurston and Pollock with the... Attorney for Janelle Grant and Callis. And she talked about a number of things. There's Here's the thing. It's a legal case. And there's not really a lot that she can say that hasn't come out publicly. But there were a few things. And, of course, she reiterated that the alleged love letter was something that Vince forced her to write. And she said that she had talked to, uh, I'm trying to find the exact terminology that she used. Um, She had talked to experts who deal with this sort of deal. Experts in sexual assault and coercive control. She said she had met with them and they said that victims frequently pressured by their abusers to write love letters. And it is a known pattern of behavior. And, of course, McMahon's attorney, uh, Jessica Tobb Rosenberg, of the same firm that MLW used to win a $20 million settlement from WWE. Uh, obviously, she is stating that uh, this was this was not that. She wanted to write a love letter. And, you know, she did 24 drafts. Makes no sense to coerce someone to write 24 drafts of a multiple-page love letter. And uh, I don't want this to come off as like I'm trying to make a joke or anything like that. But you do realize that when Vince was in charge of WWE, like he wasn't happy with Raw until there were like 24 drafts. So, I mean, the idea that, oh, he couldn't possibly have coerced her. She did 24 drafts of a letter to get it right. I'm just saying. I don't know. But obviously uh, his his attorney is saying now she, she loved him. She wrote a love letter. And... Uh, And so they're going back and forth on that. And then, obviously, the other thing that everybody was talking about was the the names that came out in the alleged love letter, where she was talking about certain individuals. You know, we can now be comfortable around certain individuals. And uh, let's see if I can find the names here. Uh, There was a Paul, obviously. And as soon as the name Paul came out, you know, everybody was like, oh, my God, did they did they just reveal that uh, Paul Levesque knew everything? And uh, the answer is no. I can't find the names here, but it was a Paul and it was somebody else. And uh, and Ann Callis did state it's not Paul Heyman. It was a uh, it's actually two brothers that were uh, assistants to Vince McMahon. And they were the two names that were uh, stated in the letters. Does anyone have the names here? I've got 5,000 notes here. I can't find two names. It driving me Paul out of my mind. Paul and Mickey, or was it not? Paul and Mickey, I believe. I forget the last names. But yes, they were... Uh, Mickey, Paul, and the chef were the names listed in the love letter. And uh, Paul was not Paul Levesque. It was uh, Paul Mangieri and Mickey Mangieri. Two brothers. And they were executive assistants who worked with Vince McMahon. So those were the two names there. And then she was asked, Ann Callis was asked, you know, Triple H, uh, was he aware of this relationship? And she said, I cannot comment on that now. Uh, Just to say that we do have witnesses still coming forward about the knowledge of executives at WWE. And, of course, I have to reiterate this. The, the important question is not only did they know about a relationship, but did they know 
about the relationship as described in the lawsuit. I mean, you know, everyone's talking about, you know, how could Paul or Stephanie or whoever, you know, Stephanie left and everything like that. You know, we don't know, A, if they knew. We presume that they would have to know. But we don't know what they know. Did they believe that, you know, Vince McMahon is, is uh, he was in a consensual relationship with another woman? And while I'm sure they weren't thrilled with it, I mean, did they just think they were in love? We don't know. And people bring up, here's another thing that I want to mention, because I don't, I don't know, okay? But people bring up Stephanie. She left, you know, when all of this started coming out. And, there, and you know, people say, well, she must have known uh, what, a, what a horrible thing was going on. And if you think about the situation, okay, yes, it is very possible that she knew some of the details that were in the filing, okay? And that's why she was furious and got out, okay? But you also have to think about this. Publicly, Vince and Linda, publicly, are allegedly still supposed to be married, okay? They've never publicly filed for divorce or anything like that. Okay, Vince is Stephanie's father, and many times it has come out that he was cheating on her mother. Okay, even if this whole Vince Janelle thing was like a completely consensual relationship, whatever. Okay, he's cheating on her mother with a woman who is younger than she is. Okay. There's no way she's happy about this, no matter what the situation actually is. So there's a lot of questions that need to be answered. There are a lot of people that need to be talked to. And by May, we are going to know a lot more because Vince McMahon, WWE, and John Laurinaitis have all been served a summons, and they must respond by mid-May. So we're about six weeks away from knowing a lot more about everybody's side of the story here. And uh, and I think that we'll have a lot to talk about. Now, one other thing I want to say that ties into this is the whole, remember the Ronda Rousey, Drew Gulak thing from yesterday? As I mentioned on Observer Radio, both of them have a different story. He claims he went to shake her hand, finger got caught on the drawstring, whatever. She claims he grabbed my drawstring. And, uh, okay, but here's the one thing that both sides agree on. There were multiple witnesses. Both of them said that. It was in a hall. Rhonda says that it happened, and there were people around, and she talked to the people, and they said, well, that's just WWE or whatever it it was that she said that they said. And Gulak said there were a bunch of people there. I went up to shake hands. and So in in that situation, in that situation... I mean, this should be, I don't want to say open and shut, but I mean, there appear that there are multiple witnesses that were right there that can corroborate one side or the other. Or maybe they, maybe all of them have the same story, but it's different from Rhonda and Drew Gulak. So Gulak is still with the company, and I would presume that they're going to interview those people that were in the hallway, and uh, and that will determine whether he remains with the company. So anyway, any thoughts on any of this? Well, I talked about that with Gulak and Rhonda yesterday, the fact that there were so many people there and their stories seemed completely different on what exactly took place. Shouldn't be too difficult to figure this out. And again, whoever is, you know, telling the weakest story here is really going to look bad because if Rhonda's putting this on this guy and he doesn't deserve it, that's nasty. It's a really nasty thing to do. Otherwise, Drew Gulak, you are pretty incredibly stupid and and maybe you know opening the door to you being out of there nick khan was on the on the town ringer podcast he didn't talk much about anything you talk about people who we still need to know some information about he's not going to voluntarily give anything up but apparently he didn't say much yesterday other than if netflix would have known it probably would not have helped the deal that they ultimately made for raw back in a moment with more observer live Um, scrolling Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, 
They're saying this was the match of the year. You mm -hmm. was the How are you feeling? Your first official match at AGW. They're already calling it match of the year. How are you feeling? I mean, I've got a lot to top now, haven't I? Like, I mean, look, once again, like, I, I can't do those type of matches without a great, like, partner to do it with. Takeshita is every bit as good as Will Ospreay. It's just on that night, I was just better, pure and simple. But, like, look at the move that I had to put him away with. Uh, the Tiger Driver, and I keep saying this so much, man. The Tiger Driver 91 <laughs> is the most dangerous move in wrestling. It is not, it, it was used back in the day by Mr. Haru Masawa. And I said it right, didn't I? I'm yeah. sure I did. But, like, <laughs> you know, I'm actually forgot that wrong, didn't I? Be like, nah! <laughs> But like it was one of the most dangerous moves in wrestling. And like, some guys like some guys are able to like kind of figure out a way of getting out of it. But like it's a complete pressure on your neck, man. It's just a, it's a sheer drop. Like I, I wouldn't be surprised in like the five months time, like people will be like, hey, you can't do that move anymore. But just like this is what I bring to the table, man. Like I'm one of the most dangerous professional wrestlers in the world. Look, I am a lovely man. I, I will walk your mum across the street any day of the week. I will happily. Give you a cuddle if you're ever feeling sad. I'm always a good shoulder to cry on and I look after you to the day I die. But I am one mean motherfucker when I want to be. Cool. Like that's all I care about, man. So like if this is so this is the first pay review of AEW's year for 2024. Right, so we got Dynasty, probably got the Forbidden Door, we've got uh Double all Nothing, in, Double Nothing, All In, All Out, uh Full Gear, no, Wrestle Dream, Full Gear, and World's End. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the right. first one. Let's go. Let's go. Like I said, the most dangerous man in wrestling right now, bro. Yes, sir. Uh, D Dowdy, uh, 104.5 FM, WCCG. I um, will. Question for you um, throughout the match, there were a lot of aha moments, a lot of momentum shifting. How were you able to stay focused and adapt to, to catch this offense? Uh, a lot of it has just been like uh, experience over in Japan, dude. Like, I mean. Once again, I, I have watched Takeshi, like I was a fan of him, I saw him live at 2019, and uh, one of my mates at the time went, God damn, he's sexy. And I was like, <laughs> so I was sitting next to him, I was just like, hey, you, you alright, calm down, mate. But, yeah, he is, isn't he? But uh, when it, well, those type of matches are happening, like I just kind of like remain uh, for my training what I did in Japan, because with that, it's, it's endurance based. You have to keep your timing right, you have to keep your energy levels down. Like not get too freaked out in those moments because like there's a lot of like heavy shots. So the moment you start freaking out and breathing heavy and like not uh, not uh, creating space from your opponent, that's when you're gonna find yourself in like difficult positions. Bless you. Uh, but for me, like it, it's not a, a rodeo. Uh, it's not a ride that I haven't ridden before. Uh, I'm very much aware of like my. Um, I think my benefit throughout a lot of these guys is um, my my gas is kind of good, uh, uh, my breathing, my, my cardio, that's what I can't even think. You see, he did a lot of brain damage there, boom, and I'm like... <laughs>
like I, I I I don't know why he did this. It was stupid. But some of the clips from uh, the CM Punk thing that what I talked about here on the show, they went up on YouTube, and I never look at comments. But it was me talking about CM Punk, so I was like, oh man, I gotta look at these comments. I just I don't know why. It was a glutton for punishment, and it's like people are so stupid. I mean, yeah. I just kept reading over and over about how I was wrong, and this. And the funny thing is, there were so many things that I said. You know, Punk is right about this, and Punk is right about that. And you know what? There were other things that he was not right about that he was wrong about. And when people listen, they only hear what they want to hear or what they want to get mad about. Okay. Now here is I I, I bring all that up because I want to talk about A W Medical. Okay. So CM Punk talked about how I tore my triceps in AEW, and I tore my triceps in WWE, and like things are, it's way better here. I I I think I feel like I could be back at any time. It's night and day. He says when I tore my triceps in AEW, man, I didn't hear from anybody for six months. I had to handle all of that myself, and you know people hear all this, and what do they say? Well, terrible. AW terrible. And then, you know, there were other people that were like, Punk must be lying. AW could not be that terrible. To them, it's either black or white. And the reality is, it's not black or white. The way it works is this. If I blow out my knee, WWE is going to send me directly to James Andrews, they're going to pay for it. You know, they're going to they're going to find a rehab place. They're going to send they're going to do everything. Everything, okay? In AEW, you blow out your knee, and what happens is you find a doctor, you find a surgeon, you find a rehab place, and you pay for this, and then there's like an app and you expense it back and they pay for it. Okay? Now, people heard that, and it was black and white again. You know, this is the better way, whatever. And the fact is, you know, it's not black or white. One way is not necessarily better than the other. In both companies, they are taking care of your injury, okay? How they do it is different. You know, and people brought up Rey Mysterio. You know, Rey Mysterio, he wanted specific people to do specific things. WWE wants specific people to do specific things. So if you're a Rey, you might prefer the way that AEW does it. Go to your guy, do your stem cells or whatever, your, your special guy that you know, and they pay you back for it, okay? Other people, clearly CM Punk is one of them. I don't want to find a doctor. I don't want to find a, a surgeon. I don't want to, like, set up my own rehab. Like, do it for me. Send me there. That's what he wants, okay? So, like, people all angry about one way or the other. I mean, hey, listen, I was rolling the other day. Lifted someone for a butterfly sweep. Pop! I was like, well, that was loud. <laughs> but you know what? It didn't hurt. It was weird. Kept rolling. Went home. And my knee was feeling kind of weird. And so I stood up and I like did a butt kicker. I just like kicked my own butt with my heel because sometimes that'll like ma make it feel better. It'll pop and kind of whatever. And it popped again and it did not feel good. And, you know, over the next 24 hours, I was like, dude, I'm screwed. Like I tore my meniscus or something. And what did I do? Well, I have a guy, <laughs> just a chiropractor down the road, but like he does a great job. They've got some newfangled laser that they, that they, I mean, it's all this stuff. And it was like, I, that's what I want to go. I want to go try that first. Okay. That's what I want to do. WWE, I'd be like sent right to James Andrews or whatever, flying all the way out to, I want to go and, and try this first. If it doesn't work, you know, my thing was, if it doesn't work, if it's not getting better, then I'm going to go get an MRI and I'm going to have to get a surgeon. Okay. Now, if that comes to pass, like, I would love somebody to set that up for me. Tell me who to go to, pay for it, tell me what to do afterwards, pay for it, and I'll do it, okay? But initially, I want to try and do my own thing. And by the way, my knee is, like, way better. 
So I think I dodged a bullet. But the point is, there is no, this is the right way, this is the wrong way. If they're, if they're reimbursing you or they're paying outright, whatever, they're paying for the injury you suffered on the job. Now, the Anthony Henry thing, what happened there? Or, or other, other people, you know, I don't even know exactly what happened with Anthony Henry. But he was released and he had a broken jaw, correct? Yes. And I believe the broken jaw happened outside of AEW. I think it was a deadlock pro show against Brian Keith. Okay. Well, so what's the situation here? If he takes an indie booking and he gets injured, should AEW pay for the injury that he suffered on an indie booking? Well, that is for you guys to argue what you think the right answer is. In WWE, they wouldn't let you do an indie date because they don't want you to get hurt. So they just don't let you do it. So if AEW allows you to take independent bookings on your own and you get hurt, should they pay for it? Now, here's the deal. Some of you will say, well, yes, it's the right thing to do or whatever. Some of you will say, no, you went and did your own thing and got hurt. If you work at McDonald's and go to Burger King and slip on the on ice or whatever, we're supposed to pay for your injury that you got somewhere else? So I don't know what the answer is, but my point in all of this is it's not black and white. It's not good guy versus bad guy. It's two different systems, and some people like some more than they like another. Anthony Henry's been rehired. That's the segue. Yes, he has. Tony Khan has decided to rehire him, but not the boys, he said in a, a, a conference call today. The boys repeatedly missed shows, something he said that was known in the locker room, and so they're not coming back. And apparently they were running wild on uh, Twitter today. I don't know Repeatedly about... missed shows. Yeah. You know, that is grounds for termination, I, I would you presume. Know, I The first time around, it could be that the case, but... Uh... You know, it, it's too bad for him. The Johnny TV, Dalton Castle stuff, from what I've seen, has been very entertaining because it's been Johnny TV and Dalton Castle doing it. And, you know, there's a great example of just maybe they, they didn't want to be there. <laughs> well, I guess I'll get on Twitter and see their side of the story if they're going off about it on social media. But, you know, you make it pretty easy for your boss to make a decision on you when you decide not to show up for work. And uh, this person goes, Shane Bays was working the GCW show tomorrow. Isn't that an indie booking? Well, that's different. That's yeah. set up by WWE. They've made an agreement, and she is going there. So if she gets hurt versus Masha Slamovich, they'll take care of everything. They'll pay for everything. So, I mean. You're an independent contract. That's different from, okay, I'm on a per-match contract with AEW, but I can do whatever I want otherwise. So I'm going to go and take some bookings wherever. I'm going to do some match in a parking lot with, you know, bombs or whatever, and I get hurt. Well, then should I say, A.W., I chose to do this show. I chose to get blown up by a bomb. Can you cover my, uh, you know? So that's the difference. And, you know, again, it's you're talking about the systems, and you're exactly right about that because you brought up stem cells and, and some things like that that guys in the NFL have gone to Europe for because their doctors know we can't do this and – then they get into it. Doctors get into it with each other over the medicines. It's just one of those things where, yeah, I guess if you're WWE at this point in the game, you should have that structure. But if you're AEW or if you're any other wrestling company, and these are your independent contractors. I mean, you can be magnanimous to a point, but if somebody goes out and gets hurt on a, on another show or something like that, they should be taking care of that. And I like the idea of being able to choose my own doctors and have my own people to go through and, you know, that sort of stuff, especially if they're going to pay for it and you bill it back anyway. And I'm sure, again, for a lot of these folks, too, I don't you know, I don't think that they would have to pay everything all at once, a forty thousand dollar surgery before they got that back from AEW. But I'm sure that AEW would have to be billed for it. To me, I think there's that's a great question that somebody should ask Tony Khan at some point of. What is the gray area there? So a guy doesn't have to come up with $80,000 first to get it back later. Back in a moment with more Observer Live.
Bring the show. Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper VB, also of WrestlingObserver.com. I'm here. Yeah. Well, you want to talk more? No. Nah. All right. Well, I want to talk about uh, a couple of things from Dynamite. We'll do the full report on the Brian and Vinny show tonight. We'll have 90 minutes to cover this NXT show and also AW Dynamite. But there is something that I want to talk about and also want to clarify. Because Dave and I had another argument last night about this one. And that is the uh, the two big matches at the beginning of the show. Hobbs versus Osprey and Danielson versus Lance Archer. And, you know, I made a comment that uh, everyone's like, some people. And that is that, you know, I, I, I mean, as in a vacuum, as matches, Hobbs and Osprey was freaking great. And Danielson and Lance Archer, and Lance Archer was freaking great. Loved the matches, okay? But, but I said, you know, if it were me, and the whole point here is we're going to do Danielson versus Osprey to determine who is the best wrestler in the world, like, shouldn't they have much more dominant victories over Hobbs and Lance Archer? And, you know, this got it, an argument started. Well, you know... They're, they're great matches. I think at one point he even said it's like a match to determine who's the best worker. I was like, what? What? And then, you know, it was, well, you don't want to do a squash. You don't want to squash hops. Listen, all I'm saying is this, okay? One of Punk's criticisms, and many people, remember how all the people go, there's no stories in AEW. Remember people said that? And then, you know, people will defend it by saying, well, the stories are told in the matches. Okay, fine. Fine. What's the story? The story to be told in these two matches is that Will Ospreay may be the best wrestler in the world. Brian Danielson may be the best wrestler in the world. And they're going to wrestle to find out which one is the best. Okay? Well, as a viewer, what does it mean to be the best wrestler? That means you're better than everybody else. Right? Yeah. Well, I watched this match, and in both matches, and actually the Danielson match was... Worse, if you want to call it that. In both matches, it was like, bro, you barely beat Hobbs. And Danielson, you barely beat Lance Archer. And you had to hit him with your finish twice. I'm not saying it needs to be a squash. Like, all I'm but saying... why did it have to be Lance Archer? Well, I mean, he, the point is, even if you're going to do Lance Archer or Hobbs, okay? And I mentioned, I mentioned uh, you know, um, Moxley. Because he's actually great at this. Moxley loves to get in there with somebody and give them a lot. Okay? That's awesome. But he will give them a lot and then he will kill them. Does okay? Moxley wobble first? There is, there, is no, there is no disputing who the better man was when a match with Moxley is over. Okay? Even a match where he's going to give the other guy a ton. Orange Cassidy. Okay? He had that match with Orange Cassidy, the one. It was like, he gave that guy a ton. But then he beat him. He was the better man. It was not, he eked out a victory by the skin of his teeth. And I'm just saying, in a feud built around who is the best wrestler, I should watch your match, and when it's over, it's like, man, that guy was no match for you, brother. Not, you barely beat him. And I've said it, and I love Brian Danielson. He's a great guy. He's a great worker. But he is the worst offender when it comes to being too giving. True. He's too giving. If, if it's going to mean something to beat you, well, you need to be a killer. And then when it's time, somebody beats you. You should be a champion. And when it's time to put someone over, they win a title from you. Instead, he loves to go in there in every match. I got to give. I got to make Lance Archer look like a world beater. Well, listen, now is not the time to make Lance Archer look like a world beater. Now is the time to make you look like a world beater. Now is the time to make Osprey look like a world beater. Because the whole story of this feud is it's the two world beaters to end all world beaters. Because the story is, you're the two best on earth, and we're going to see who's better. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. I didn't hate the match. I don't dislike AEW. 
I just think the story of the match should have been different than the one they told. That's all. And it's okay. In fact, you should have, with plenty of people, multiple stories kind of going on at once. One main one and then things that, that hide in the shadows so you can interweave them in. But how they have arc these two guys together against each other at Dynasty isn't matching up with what I assume is going to be the Don Callis family turning on on uh, Osprey. Osprey. And it seems as if he should have gone through that, gotten done with that, and then had Danielson kind of right there if you were going to do this match. But I don't know. They seem to be dragging out this deal with the Callis faction and it's just one of those things I, I don't know. And, and Lance Archer, who I like a lot and can be very valuable there, especially as a big crazy guy who kills people because he is so much bigger than ever everybody. Why not have, and I'm not saying J.D. Drake, but somebody else in that position. So as you said, you can Danielson can give him a little bit, but he still gets a very clear victory as he walks back to the back. I, I just, I don't know. I, I just, yeah, you're right. And it's nothing to get too bent out of shape about, but it's just one of those things where it's like, I don't know if any of this is as effective as it should be leading to that match. Although, as we've seen a million times when it comes to AEW pay-per-views, you, the the bill doesn't have to be good. The people that are buying those shows and they do it consistently at over a hundred thousand at a clip, they're there to see that match. So, you know, at the end of the day, I guess if you look at it that way, they're getting what they want and everything is going to be fine. But it doesn't it doesn't make for good cohesiveness. Remember that uh, segment where uh, The Rock beat up Cody outside the building in the rain and busted him open? And everybody was raving about how awesome that was. Yeah. And then other people are like, ah, it's so old school, there ain't nothing. Well, this uh, this main event segment with Swerve and Joe was practically the exact same thing. It was the most old school, basic segment, but it was awesome. And it was essentially Joe coming out and saying, you've had title matches, you, you're on a great rise, I know the perfect ending of the story is beating me, but if you sign that contract with me, I am going to kill you. And then Swerve does his promo, and he says, I'm going to win that title. We're starting a dynasty here. You're a killer, but so am I. April 21st, I'm going to show you I'm the better man. So then they get into a brawl. Joe just shoves him, and Swerve punches him, starts choking him with his chain. Joe headbutts his way free, wraps a chain around, starts beating on Swerve. Swerve's a bloody mess. Joe starts leaving the ring, and Swerve, all he has to say is, if that's all you've got, I'm taking that title from you for sure. And he takes the pen, and he smears his own blood all over the pen, and he signs the contract in his own blood, and Joe is furious, and he storms down to the ring, and he grabs this guy, and he gives him the urinage through the table and leaves him for dead. It was nothing unique. It was nothing new. It was something we've seen a million times, but it ruled. And uh, I thought this segment was great. But I do wonder, like, what are they going to do? What are they going to do with these two guys? Because we mentioned it the other day. Like, Swerve should be AEW champion. But clearly, Will Ospreay is winning the title at All In. And if Swerve is your babyface world champion, he's going to be booed out of the building at Wembley, okay? Would it not be better to have Will win the title from Joe and then Swerve wins the title later on down the road? I mean, you could have him win the title at the pay-per-view, but A, everybody's expecting that. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but everyone's expecting like it's just a foregone conclusion. And B, Hangman's vanished. And Hangman had one point that he made over and over, and that is, I will never let you become AEW champion. And so I think it's very possible that Hangman does screw him out of this match. Joe does lose the title to Will Ospreay at Wembley. And then, you know, Will Ospreay puts over Swerve for the title a little further down the road. Now, the thing is, with all of this long-term booking, it's like this is all well and good, but, I mean, there's so many people on this roster. There's so many people. And MJF's going to be coming back. Adam Cole's going to be coming back. 
I mean, I don't know what they're going to do with this title, but all I know is Joe is awesome. And uh, and I think that Osprey has to win the title at Wembley. And how you work swerve into that now or later as champion, I don't know. But we're going to find out. Well, it's not like they hot potato the title around and people can accept short title reigns if the story is good and if they are into what is going on. So Swerve defeating Joe, I mean, Joe's in that position of like Ilya Dragunov where it's like, okay, yeah, you could put the belt back on Carmelo so you could do that. And I'm not saying that they didn't mismanage Carmelo and Trick when it came to a step, but it's like Dragunov is so good. Samoa Joe is so good at what he does. I think... Your scenario laid out about Hangman Page, I think, is probably how they will go because he has been gone. He was not suspended. I know everybody's like, well, no, he was suspended from the elite. That's fine. That took care of that story. He was never suspended by AEW in any storyline. So him coming back to do that, that could be a good idea. If you want to have Swerve win the title, Page could screw him out of it later on where Joe wins it back or Takeshita wins it or... Okada wins it because at the end of the day when it comes to Wembley Stadium Will Ospreay in a match for the AEW World Championship is what you want you want him to have a great match well he can have a great match with any of those people I just named and have it mean something so and that's not even counting MJF into that mix or anybody else so they do have a lot of options in four months again depending on how they have this thing played out you can do another title change if you decide to change it at dynasty and you know if you want more you can listen to the brian and Vinny show tonight but what do you want me to say about billy gunn and jay white it sucked it absolutely positively sucked and i think it's actually a rare thing involving AEW where i don't think anyone's going to argue this one i don't think anyone's going to stick up for billy gunn and jay white Although, actually, the one guy did. He, he was like, uh, well, it played perfectly into the storyline of Jay White and the home invasion. No, and no, it's it like, didn't. well, you know, maybe if it was like a good home invasion, but like <laughs> they walked into their dad's house and threw a milk jug off the thing and then they left. They ran away. So, I mean, it wasn't even like a, you know, great home invasion. So it, it was terrible. I, I, I. It was not the worst in history, though. You can't put it down there with like, you know. The, I can the because it involved Jay White. Well, they, if it had been, they were shushing each other. Come if on. it had been Billy Gunn against one of his kids, but and this, this was point, a match, fine. Who cares? You know, I'm Jay in the for White. Jay White, but he's a comedy character. He's a comedy character. I know. The point is, he shouldn't be. It's ridiculous. I know he shouldn't. What are we be, doing here? It is ridiculous, and I feel bad. Look, Juice Robinson would play all of this a lot better if he was there. Unfortunately, he's not. But my God, get him back quick because they seem to have no plans with Jay White as a singles, at least with Juice Robinson. That would be great again. So please hurry back, Juice. If I'm Jay White, I guess I'd just go ahead and take the paycheck. But this is unbelievable what they've done with a guy that you brought over here and wanted to make a big star. If this is it, ooh. Yeah, I mean, maybe you could say that the uh, elite in the Dark Order angle at the end of December that one year oh, that was, was bad. Was, that was worse, bad. but I mean, I don't know, man. I don't know. <laughs> this was so bad. <laughs> anyway, back in a moment, Observer Live. Keith Elliott Greenberg with Inside the Ropes magazine. What's up, Keith? This is a very historic night tonight, and there were a number of legends in the arena. Uh, were you able at some point to slow down enough to glean any knowledge or at least inspiration from those legends? So this honestly is, I hope I'm allowed to say it, but like, so I, I was like, ah, ah, backstage the doctor was like, all right, on the table, we'll just put some ice on your butt. And like, I was like laying on the table, ah. <laughs> and then like, Ric Flair walked in and I was like, ah, and stood up. <laughs> And he was just, and he said, uh, "You are everything I've heard of and more. You are one of the best wrestlers in the world." And that coming from him is just like, "Thank you, Mr. Ric Flair. Thank you very much." Cause he's a standard. Like I, I know, like I, I know, sometimes I like, get forgotten about, but like every like little bit of wrestling has some like inspiration from Ric Flair, man. So like the fact that he was able to like just come over and just go like, "You're the fucking man," is like, man, amazing, like brilliant stuff. 
a bit of a two-parter. Uh, Tony, you were present for a pretty crazy match that Will had a couple weeks ago. I'm interested to hear like what goes through your mind when somebody who you've already invested in is having a, a, a match like that, which is incredible, but also uh, risky. And Will, when we had spoke prior, you, you communicated how important it was for you to still be able to live in the UK. Uh, how important was that to coming here, and, and what kind of schedule will you be on moving forward? Well, I, I was a tremendous match. That was an amazing, amazing, amazing match for Will to finish up in Rev Pro. And after a great run in New Japan and Rev Pro, I thought Will versus Michael Oku was a great match. And I was really blown away, not only by the quality of the wrestling, but also uh, really the quality of people. I got to meet Will Ospreay's family for the first time, which was really cool. The, so sweet, dude. You're the man. And uh, the the great things he said afterwards it was just really kind and uh, I thought the way he helped uh, really set up his debut in AEW and also paid tribute to the great fans in the UK that helped him get to this place it was really a great thing and it was great to be there and of course the match took a big toll I think physically but knowing it's Will Ospreay you know I had a high confidence he was going to be here be ready for revolution and uh, he was everything we would have expected the match was everything we would have expected. I thought Osprey versus Takeshi had delivered, Revolution delivered, and again, I think Will Osprey in AEW fits like a glove, as you're seeing here tonight uh, firsthand. Thank you, Sean. I'm basically Wolverine, bro, and I'll be fine in like a couple of days. Just heal up. And the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Stardom's on right now. Bloodsport, I think, started half hour ago. So I'm going to try to watch Bloodsport, SmackDown, Ring of Honor pay-per-view, and the Blue Panther-Brian Danielson match. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Uh, between now and late Friday night. I'm going to try and do a show Friday night, either solo or if we can get Mike on or whatever. I can't promise anything right now. That's a lot of stuff. And then Saturday, we'll watch NXT, as well as night one of WrestleMania. And uh, probably do a show after NXT and after WrestleMania with Vinny, although I don't know yet. And then Sunday, obviously, there is uh, night two of WrestleMania. And somewhere in there, there's Collision. And uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff. I'll watch as much as I can. So, be ready, everybody. Be ready for some audio magic. <laughs> you know what you need on a, on a show where you have to watch uh, 500 hours is also have to listen to 300 hours. Yes. So, we'll make sure that you've got it's more than enough. For serving the market here. For, uh, for the following <laughs> days and weeks to come. But, yes, that's, that's the plan. So, be ready. It'll be on WrestlingObserver.com and video. .f4wonline.com. And be ready for tomorrow, the mystery of whether or not the boss man is going to be here That's on a right. Friday. We'll find out, everybody. We'll find out what time I drop these blokes off. But anyway, we're out of time. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live.